From the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. All right, welcome back. My name is John, and this is the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly and the original podcast about consumption. With me this week is the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. His name is Sean. Sean, how are you doing today? John, my boy, I just came out of the wall to talk to you today. How you been? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm just dusting off the cobwebs, you know, trying to get back in the flow of the week. Nothing special. Yeah, that's all I got. Episode over. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been? What have you been watching this week, Sean? Not a whole lot. Don't have much to talk about. The one thing that I watched, and you'll be happy to hear about, is I watched the Kevin Smith documentary Clerk. Not Clerks. Clerk. Yeah, you got to move your hands and gesticulate wildly and make the face like someone stuck their thumb up your sphincter without telling you first or giving you any kind of warning. I, I can't talk through it either because, you know, the, <laughs> the gestures Marcel, Marcel don't part translate well. Right. Not to podcast. No, no. So. This is or that. Yeah. So. <laughs> I prefer not to have any How filming of my uh, rectum being entered without my knowledge. It was okay. I want to get paid for it if I'm going to do that. I mean, especially if it's going to be on film or yeah, for digital. sure. So. It wasn't bad. It's a big retrospective of his entire career, basically starting from when he was a uh, leaving high school. I, I, actually, it talks a lot about his like in high school, how he met people in Highland, New Jersey, the community center that he hung out with, and that's where like Clerks was forged. The story for Clerks were forged. It goes through. Pretty much the making of all of his movies. They talk, I mean, they talk about really anything you can think of. There's a lot of guests that come on and I don't know guests, but people that they interview for the show, for the show, for the movie. So they have like Penn Jillette. They talk to his wife. Or, they talk to why? his kid. Is it just because he, is it just he, um, because he did that potato diet that Penn Jillette made up? Yeah, they kind of talk about that. They don't really say what the specific yeah. diet is, but they talk to his wife. They talk to Scott Mosier quite a bit. They talk to Jason Mewes. Basically, anybody that you could think of, Ben Affleck is in it. They talk to Matt Damon, but it goes through all his movies. It goes through basically filming of Clerks and then going on to Mallrats and how that really bombed compared to what they thought it would be. And they talk about how he was the next coming of the great American filmmaker, young indie filmmaker. They talk about how, you know, it's just basically anything you can think of about Kevin Smith's career. They, they pretty much talk about, they talk about his heart attack. They talk about his diet, his losing weight. No way. Yep. They talk about the podcast. No way. Yeah. They talk about his heart attack. They do. No way. They talk about that. I've they talk about that story. <laughs> I'm sure, and he's never told it. First time ever. Never. They talk about the weed and the, the podcasts and, you know, the different podcasts, the comic book store, the comics. It's basically, it's not made by Kevin Smith and he's not a, an executive like producer on any of it or anything, but they pretty much had all access to talk to him about whatever, anything Kevin Smith you could, you could think of. So again, all of his career, a lot of his personal life, you know, they talk about chasing Amy. They talk about all of his movies and all the downfalls. They talk onto his moving onto Red State and Tusk and the horror kind of period, I guess, that he went through. Yoga hosers and how he was going to have his heart attack and was didn't want that to be his last movie and all this wouldn't stuff. Wouldn't want that so. to be my last movie either. I'm not sure they've done better since then, but I wouldn't want that to be my I last haven't movie seen it. either. But yeah, I mean, they kind of just anything again anything you could think of kevin smith related they pretty much talk to him about he's really in that respect it's very candid it's very open he's not really a very pro not not that he's not private but he's he wears his heart on his sleeve so you know sure. they, they pretty much talk about all of it so if you or anyone's curious the because kevin smith has talked about it ad nauseum probably on one of his podcasts or somewhere else i hear him talk but the potato diet is basically you can have as many potatoes that you want on this diet but that is your entire diet is potatoes but you can only you can't cook them in oil you can like bake them you can boil them stuff like that and you can't put anything on them so no salt no pepper no bacon sour you know whatever you're just eating potatoes and if i remember right i didn't read <laughs> penjoet's book because I, it didn't sound that interesting yeah but if i remember right what kevin smith had said about it was he started with it really liking potatoes, and by like day two, he was like, "I fucking hate potatoes." <laughs> but 
that's kind of what it does is it makes you not want to eat much and i guess potatoes are just like so fiber heavy they just kind of shoot through you if that's all you're eating i could see that yeah it will in turn cause a lot of weight loss rapidly i don't think that's sustainable obviously and i I know he didn't do that but i guess it's a I don't know if popular is the right word but i know he heard about it from pen gillette i don't remember where pen gillette heard about it but i've heard of a couple other celebrities have done this and i'm that's that sounds like some pen and teller level flim flam scammy not scammy but just bullshit and why not did you so speaking of pen and teller and bullshit did you ever watch the show they used to have on showtime called bullshit i did i watched it a lot when it first came on and after a while i got really tired of pen and teller Telling me what uh, how I was doing things and I was an idiot. Basically, yeah, that's kind of how I felt. But I did, yeah. But I did really enjoy it for about the first. I think I went like eight seasons. I think I enjoyed time. it for about four of them or, or about half of its run. But you're right. Somewhere around halfway through, I'm like, all right, that's enough of these two. <laughs> so one of them doesn't even talk, and he still sounds like an asshole. So they have a show that I see a lot on my YouTube recommendations. I think it's Penn and Teller Fool Me or Fool Us or whatever. And it's magicians yeah. that come on. They try and do tricks in front of them to see if they can figure out how the trick can be done. That was on either NBC or a, one of the major networks for a while. That seems like that has a shit ton of seasons, too. Oh, I'm sure. It might not have a shit ton of seasons, but because it was on a network channel, I think it has a shit ton of episodes. Because, you know, network ones, they do yeah, 30 obscene, episodes. like, 30 episode seasons or something like that. So even if there's only two seasons of it, there's around 60 different episodes there so yeah and probably three comedians per episode yeah something like that but yeah i agree with you though i'm kind of that comedian sorry. permanently man will column a will column b i'm kind of permanently over pen and teller for the time being i haven't found my way back to them since i got over bullshit so nothing else that you watched this week no i think we in real time just talked a couple days ago so i haven't had really all that much time to watch much of anything been play, playing Baldur's Gate on my PC, Baldur's Gate 3. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's been pretty cool. I really actually liked that game back like on the old PC days, like whatever the hell it was, probably Windows XP or something. Not enough to make me want to reinvest in a gaming system to go play it now, but you know that's the kind of game that might be able to twist my arm into it if I was going to try to. But that's interesting, so... Yeah, it's I good. Don't know. One of these days, maybe we'll talk about a game other than Super Mario Brothers movie, so... That's, that ain't no game. That's that ain't, that no, ain't game. no game. What have you been watching, John? I haven't had a lot of time to catch up on stuff either. I've had kind of a weird week. So I, I watch our, like you mentioned, we recorded a couple of days ago and I had to try to catch up on both those. And we went a couple of days here without power, which always makes it hard to watch movies and things like that. <laughs> so outside you didn't of You get the hand, topic, hand crank out to uh, turn some... I tried. My arm got tired. Oh, so only got five minutes in. Distracted. Yeah, and that gets frustrating. But uh, the only other thing I really watched, I mentioned before watching the uh, Johnny Manziel episode, and I I find myself liking this Untold series that's on Netflix right now that's just these behind-the-scenes sports documentaries. I really want to get to the Steroids one, which I skipped over because I thought the Florida Gators one, it's called Swamp Kings. I I went into it like, oh, this will be kind of short. Yeah, no, it's four hours long, but I got through that. Is it two parts or is it it's one straight episodes. thing? Oh, okay. So it, it is like a mini it's series. It's four episodes. Yeah. It's kind of shitty though, in the sense like, yeah, you see some behind the scenes stuff and you see a lot of team stuff and there's things that I wouldn't have known about the team, but I don't like that team. So I can't really say that I care that much. What it doesn't give you it. Well, it does make Urban Meyer look like a bigger dickhead than most people think he is to begin with. But what it doesn't give you, I was hoping for some like dirt on you know, the whole Aaron Hernandez thing, because supposedly, and I don't know how true this is, but I had heard when all the shit was going down with him when he was still on the Patriots, like he was supposedly charged with shooting a guy in the eye or something while he's at Florida and numerous bar fights and all kinds of other shit, like crazy shit when he was there. And they barely even touch on him being on the team. Like they have one, because they go basically each, not each episode, they go season by season. It's essentially just spanning the five years that Urban was there. So his first year and then the four years of Debo, essentially. The year that Aaron Hernandez gets there, they're like, we had a loaded team and they just rattle off like 10 guys. Some of them, you know, some of you, it kind of depends on how big of a football fan you are as to how much you would know. Some of these, um, well, they're not characters, they're players, almost said characters. And he's just kind of mentioned in that group. I think his name comes up one other time in the whole series. I was like, how are you going to do an untold story of these 
Florida Gator teams and not even like bring up the most, he's not the most famous guy on that team because they had Tebow at like the height of Tebow mania. Maybe the most, but he's certainly the most infamous, infamous guy. Yeah. Lots of salacious yeah. shit so about I, this guy I, basically killing two people while he was still playing for the university. Of. Yeah. So yeah, I, I was kind of, and maybe they, I wouldn't be surprised if they had like a season to assist, keep that out of the documentary or something like that. I, I really don't know, but it felt like, again, I don't follow Florida that close, but I do follow football pretty close. It just felt like a gaping hole in a, what should have been a moderately interesting story at least. So, but it's like any other, other of these that I always blow about. It's, it's entertaining for what it is. I just wish they would have gone a little deeper on some of the stuff other than like, I know they won two national championships. I know they lost two. I, I don't really care that much about that. I mean, I do, but I don't, you know, we're perfect for the, for the dirt on this one. I just, I had heard that it was kind of a Urban Meyer reclamation kind of project where they gloss over a lot of his shit. And like you, it makes him look like a dickhead. He is a dickhead, I, but it, it also kind yeah. of tried to make him look a little larger than, a little more holier than thou, I think. I think it tries to make him look like some second coming of, I don't want to say Nick Saban because he's still coaching, but, you know, pick your iconic college coach and he certainly is that like i mean he is a dick but you can't argue his record at the college level like he's proven to be successful multiple times in multiple schools with at pretty much every level you can think of in the college ranks now the pros is a whole different conversation but the stuff they're showing especially in the first two seasons that that he's there i'm like 99 percent sure there's no way that shit would fly now like if he got like hired again let's just say for the sake of argument if texas or something hired him there's some of the stuff that he's doing that i'm pretty sure that i don't know some activist group or some like student rights group would be like you can't work your guys that hard they're not professionals it it paints him in a light of being this great coach but still being a complete asshole basically but past that the only other thing i've really been keeping up on i'm caught up on hard knocks up until today i think that's on probably right now as we're recording and then i'm two episodes back now on winning time so i'm i'm falling behind and right? i'm not not a fan of that not a fan of falling behind not not at the moment so this is also the time of year with football starting up if i fall behind on something it might as well just stay there until february because i run out of time to watch shit yeah but that's okay because i i supplement that with watching wonderful original content like the movie cobweb that came out on the same weekend as Barbie and Oppenheimer. What is Cobweb? It might or might not be the topic of this episode. Oh. What is Cobweb? Why don't you tell me about a third-party review? Okay. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this movie actually hasn't been out very long, and I had no idea what this movie was until I saw another podcast just talking about it in passing. Credit to Doom Generation Pod. They were talking about it, and that kind of piqued my interest in it because they have excellent taste in movies and they didn't say whether they liked the movie or not they just said that was something that they had watched so our third party review for this movie comes from andrew h it is on rotten tomatoes i picked this one because this time i actually might or might not agree with this it's half a star out of five stars it's a lazy horror movie preying on people who are so starving for content that they will watch damn near anything the only joy i got out of it was that my wife and i could find something to make fun of on every single scene. The ending is terrible, so don't get your hopes up. So, you might have an idea of where we're going to end up going on this, or at least where I'm going to go on this episode. I don't know where Sean's going to go with it, but Sean, tell me about this movie. Give me the plot of this movie. All right. So, the IMDb.com storyline and plot are both. An eight year old boy tries to investigate the mysterious knocking sounds that are coming from inside the walls of his house, unveiling a dark secret that his sinister parents have kept hidden from him. Just to mention, John and I, we don't talk about this movie. We don't talk, real, not this, just this movie, but we don't talk about any of these movies beforehand. So when you guys are hearing what we're saying, we actually try to avoid conversations about movies that we're watching, unless we've already had them. Right. But we, we try to avoid it ahead of time so that it's, well, I, I think for me, it just feels like I'm not repeating myself then. I like to keep the mystery and I like to surprise you with what I'm going to say about it. So that's generally why I don't bring it up. Just because, like, you, yeah, I don't want to repeat myself. and We need content for the show, goddammit. Right. In fairness, I do think I was bitching about this movie before you even watched it, which probably doesn't help. So, Well, you kept it to a minimum. I think I might have tipped my hand a little bit. So, anyway, this movie is, like we mentioned, it's, it's focused around an eight-year-old boy named Peter. I thought he was 37. 
but he's eight. <laughs> his picture on IMDb looks like he is the like a drugged up like backup for some hippie band. It's really disappointing. The kid's fine. He doesn't piss me off in the movie, honestly. It also stars Anthony Starr as his father, Lizzie Kaplan as his mother, and Cleopatra Coleman, who plays his substitute teacher. That's really the main four characters, I would say, in the show, unless I'm for or, or the show, the movie, unless I'm forgetting someone. I mean, there's other people, but that's who the story focuses on. The main cast are these these four people. And Anthony Starr, you might recognize as Homelander from The Boys, which, John, if you haven't watched The Boys, you need to get on that. Not. And then Cleopatra yeah, Coleman. Yeah, that since we started this show. Cleopatra Coleman was in Infinity Pool as one of the main characters, so we've talked about one of her movies so far. But yeah, so basically... And Lissy Kaplan's been in like a million yeah, things. She's and been in a ton of To be of perfectly stuff. honest, she was the reason that I was on board to watch this movie, because I'm not saying she's like the best actress in the world or actor or whatever, but in general, I like Lizzie Kaplan as, a, as an actor, Yeah, I would say. And this is the first horror produced thing that Seth Rogen has done, right? Yeah, Seth Rogen and what's his name? Evan Goldman? Is that it? I believe so. I think? Yeah, this is their first, like, romp into the horror genre. Yeah, and they've done a ton of, obviously, other things. Yeah, you if you... This isn't really... A, we haven't done... We've only done one or two comedy movies, but if you like comedy over the last, what, two decades, you've probably seen a bunch of their stuff, I would say. That's fair. So let's kind of... Before we even get into the story and like start breaking down this movie, how weird is it that they decided to drop this movie... I don't even know if this movie has a trailer, but they decided to drop this movie the same weekend in theaters as Barbie and Oppenheimer. Doesn't that seem like you're just setting yourself up for like failure financially anyway? Was this actually was this actually released this in that theaters. same weekend? Yes, in theaters. Not on streaming, not on whatever. This went this was a theatrical release. Well, this says IMDb says which, the release date was July nineteenth. Well, I guess that's France. That might have been when I, I that's about a month. That's around when Barbie and all that came out. I know, as I said, I was watching reviews before we recorded, and it came up several times that this came out the same weekend as okay. those two. Yeah, July 21st. So, limited, a limited release July 21st. Yeah, that, again, I'm not even talking critically. I'm just saying financially. Yeah, no, I know. It really seems like you're yeah. setting yourself for failure if you're going against arguably the two big, biggest movies of the summer. Of the year. Yeah, that too. So, it's a weird choice by the studio and it almost says to me like it makes it feel like the studio didn't really have faith in it like you hear that a lot with movies that come out in january, january and february yeah, around like dumping them before the award season or whatever right yeah they're just trying to get them out there and like get whatever they can just to move on with it that's kind of what it feels like they would have done with this this was a Lionsgate release so this is a studio behind it that has the money to again at least put a trailer up or put take a social media campaign or something. Or hold on to it for a couple months. Yeah, this would have made so much more sense to come out in September or October, even in August, than it would in July. It does feel like a weird kind of dumping it off against these big movies, but maybe they were hoping that with all the publicity that these other movies got, that other, you know, just the runoff, the, sure. you know, the people that weren't able to get in to see Barbie and Oppenheimer are going to go and see Cobweb. But I really didn't see a whole lot of publicity about this movie. Is that even a thing anymore? Like, okay, neither of us really go to theaters very often. But in the times that you've gone to a theater, has it even been remotely close to full when you've gone? Because I've been to... Since I'll just use since COVID as a like barometer, I've been to like five different films and I don't think there's ever been more than six people in the theater. The only one that I can remember seeing that was really big was, oh, geez, I want to say it was one of the Marvel movies or there was a Star Wars movie or something that came out in 2020 that I went and saw. And, you know, it was like a big hyped movie. So there were a ton of people. But I just recently saw Into the Spider-Verse. That's the last movie I saw in the theater and the first movie in a long time that I saw in the theater. And it was the same weekend as when Indiana Jones came out and there was something else that came out. And it wasn't really. I mean, I went to a small theater. Spider-Verse wasn't very, very packed. So, yeah, I, I don't think that whole runoff kind of effect still seems to happen. But I don't. I don't understand why this movie would have been put out at the same time. It just really doesn't make sense unless the theater, or the theater, the studio wasn't really 100% confident because they could have held it for two months and released it around Halloween and put a lot more backing into it 
as that's the time that people go see movies like this. Right. But why are we saying that? Why are we saying that, John? <laughs> well, and that's that's what we're going to. So this movie really, really, for me, it feels like it really just is a hodgepodge of ideas that all feel really, really familiar, like you've seen them before. It really leans into like the spooky any town USA. Like it, it feels like this guy watched Halloween a bunch of times. Said this is going to be my head field or pick your fictional town because I don't think they ever give an exact location for this. It's Pennsylvania, I think, and that's one of the cars it- that drives has a Pennsylvania license plate. So that's really the only reason I would I would say that. We'll go with that. So if we get in a little bit of the story, Peter is a young boy who. He seems to have an okay house, but he seems to be a bit of a loner, stays to himself, and he has a substitute teacher, played by Cleopatra Coleman, who comes in and whatever. He's kind of a bit of an outcast. He has trouble sleeping because there's he hears knocking at his wall, and he goes to the wall and he knocks, and it knocks back, and he freaks out, and his mom comes in to check, and she's like, listen, there's no problem here. It's fine. It's not knocking back. When I knock, go back to bed. Everything's cool. And we find out as the movie goes on that there's someone in the wall who Peter is talking to who's giving him ideas to go stand up for himself and, you know, to be a little bit assertive and that his parents are bad people. You don't get the idea that his parents are necessarily bad. They seem like they're just regular old parents until... A little weird. Yeah, maybe a little off. Lizzie Kaplan, the mom, seems a little bit more off than the dad, but... They almost seem overbearing to start with. Until a certain point. Yeah, like they won't let him go anyway. out on Halloween because a girl that lived in the neighborhood vanished before Peter was born. And when Peter starts to hear the voice, it's kind of like black phone <laughs> a little bit. We should say right now, too, that this movie is only about a month old. And I don't like I said I've only seen a couple people even mention this movie. So from this point forward, this is going to be your spoiler warning. This is one. I'm going to spoil this movie because I'm going to let some hatred out, I think. Some bile some bile or maybe i'm gonna let some like praises out we'll see what happens oh i like this i like this uh this teaser that you're giving i'm i'm all ears let's hear it (laughs) anyway this is your spoiler warning like if you want to watch this movie first without us ruining it or without hearing our opinion on it i don't even know for sure where you can get this let me tell you okay you can check it out on apple tv for 6.99 you can watch it in the theater you can watch it apple tv amazon google YouTube, Vudu, some Microsoft thing. Yeah. You can buy it for 15 bucks or rent it for 7 bucks on all those services. So all the usual spots where you can rent a movie. So yeah, if you want to hear that, you'll see this before hearing us talk about it. Now's your chance. Okay, back to what we were saying. So Peter is seeing things, hearing things, is very much playing up on the whole, like, what goes bump of the night. It does have those vibes, kind of like the black phone. And I, I'm... 90% sure that's because The Black Phone was the last movie I watched that had focused primarily on kids being the main character. Or had that idea in it. Yeah, it has that same kind of vibe in it as far as what's playing up on it. We're going to come back to that because I have more to say about that. But as the movie progresses, you kind of realize that more is going on with Peter and this voice that he's... You almost don't know if he's hearing it in his head or if it's actually in the wall to start. It progresses and he kind of starts opening up and forming this relationship with the substitute teacher, which why is she a substitute teacher? Why isn't she just his teacher? Like, yeah, why did it have to be someone different? Yeah. Maybe it's the second set of eyes on Peter because he is such an outcast that nobody, you know, the regular quote unquote teacher wouldn't have listened to him. I don't really know. I don't know. It just seems like a weird for something that we don't get that reasoning or it doesn't have any like we don't see the other teacher because what his actual teacher at any point. It just seems like a stupid detail that they push on there more than once in the movie. Like they remind you that this is a sub. I don't know. Anyway, so basically what ends up happening is, you know, it's clickbaity and like standard horror movie is that plot description sounds that's basically what it is and it kind of divulges into his teacher believes him his parents have something else going on up their sleeve and then there's this third entity which is whatever's going on in the wall that eventually we find out is a a different thing that we'll dive into am i missing much here so well the other thing that becomes very key to the story oh the beast story i guess is there's a classmate of peter's who bullies him 
about he keeps teasing him that he, he's going to get it at recess and yada, yada, yada. And he ends up... He's just a dick. Yeah, he's just a little shithead kid that basically... That ruins Peter's pumpkin that he painted. And Peter retaliates against him. And then that, that feeds into the end of the movie. that The confrontation, a secondary confrontation that happens. And I have like some thoughts about that too, but we'll get into that. I do think just again, for whatever it's worth, they never explicitly say what time period this is supposed to take place in. You do see cell phones used though. So I'm assuming this, this is modern day supposed to be modern day, yeah. not like a, a period thing. Cause I've heard some people say that like in trying to like figure stuff out leading up to this, that they thought this was like set in the nineties. I'm like, mm, they didn't have iPhones in the nineties, you know? So was there anything about this movie that stuck out to you that you really liked? No. Um, to, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> the movie We're on the same page. Yeah. Good. The movie to me really felt like when it was over, this isn't a movie I would, it's, it will just b blend in. If someone will say, Hey, did you ever see cobweb? And I'll say, is that the movie about the knocking in the wall? And somebody, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I saw that. But I, this isn't a movie that I would really ever go back and watch because it's just not. <laughs> so at the beginning, let me just preface it by saying this at the beginning, it really has this very creepy feel to it. Like when we first start to hear from the voice in the wall and the knocking and everything and the mom comes in, I was really waiting for a jump scare to happen that something was just going to pop out or we were going to get this confrontation with whatever a it was. A much bigger thug, yes. thug or something. Yeah. Get something that was in the wall because they do these these elements where like the Peter's door will swing open, there's nobody there, or it'll just be black in the hallway and then you'll see a figure down the hall. You know, just... It had like, when you said that it has these elements of different movies, it was like it had these feelings of like Black Phone. It had feelings of the original Insidious. It had feelings Barbarian. of... Barbarian. Of all, yeah, Barbarian. Just all these different horror movies that they just made this like collage of all these different ideas into this specific story. So no, there wasn't really anything in this movie that stood out, but I felt at the beginning it had a lot of potential because of that kind of creepiness, that eerie factor. You didn't quite know what was going to happen, and I was expecting a big scare to come, and it really just didn't ever come in that opening scene. I watch the movie, like I don't watch these movies with the lights off or anything. I generally am sitting at my computer or I'm sitting in front of the TV. It's either daytime or the lights are on, and it's not because of whatever. I actually... I watch this in the perfect setting. I watch this in the middle of a fucking like monsoon yeah, like tornado. thunderstorm. Yeah, hurricane, so, practically. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. So aside from the last like six minutes when my power went out. But anyway, no, I, I agree with you. There's not really anything once like so many of these movies that we watch, even the ones that we don't like, we can be like, I don't like this, but blah, blah, blah happened. And that was really rad or whatever the case is has these redeeming qualities to it. Right. And I don't want to say this is totally like unredeemable because I, I guarantee you there's a lot of people that are going to like this movie because of the vibe it has, the time of year it is, blah, 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 all that shit. I'll say the kid, uh, Woody Norman, that plays Peter, as far as like a young child actor goes, there's nothing that he does in this movie that is bad. Like he's not an obnoxious kid. He's not, he's fine. He gives a good performance and I, I, I would not be opposed to seeing him in another movie, whether it's horror or otherwise. Like he's there's nothing with him or really anyone in this movie that's necessarily bad performance wise. It's almost a lot of they're doing the best they can with what they were given, what little they were given. But, you know, you mentioned like it's got these like feelings of movies like Barbarians where it starts Barbarians, Barbarian, Barbarians is a different movie. It starts going down like one road and it tries to take these little twists to like throw you off of what you're seeing. But we've seen that so many times that it's like, okay, they're doing the barbarian thing or pick your movie like that, that you want to have. You mentioned the black phone and I, I had vibes of that too, because of again, primarily the kids, but much like the black phone, I never felt like this kid was going to not make it through the end of this movie. Like whatever happened in this movie, I was like, this kid's going to be fine you know, relatively speaking, might be traumatized, but that's not for the movies. But unlike the Black Phone, the Black Phone had a very well-designed villain. Maybe they didn't execute everything as far as how that character acted or how, at least in my opinion, like, I didn't think he was deserving of a franchise, which I guess we're getting one anyway. But if you just look at the character, what was his name? The Noodler or whatever <laughs> the fuck he was? The Dog um, Monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
if you just look at that character, like the and a still image of that character, I was like, all right, off that alone, I will watch this movie because you made a interesting looking villain. Creep. That's enough yeah. to sell. He looks like a creep. Yeah. So this movie doesn't deliver on really any of that. And there's other like there's a million other movies. Like I've heard people say like they compare this to the remade it movies and i'm sure that's because there's kids in it and it's creepy i guess this is also the same like production team that did barbarian and it so that probably has a lot to do with it too i just i don't feel like any of these elements when we do see them pay off it's not satisfying it's not original it doesn't really do anything to separate it from the crowd and it just leaves you feeling like i've seen this shit before and i saw it even in the movies like i i hated barbarian we went well over that plenty of times i enjoyed i would watch barbarian over this 10 out of 10 times because at least it felt like its own thing this does the other thing about this movie that i found really weird and i think you kind of alluded to it is that they do this whole this whole front half of the movie seems like you're going down one path you have the creepiness of the kid you have the voice in the wall we're going to find out what the voice in the wall is the parents are like they're aware of it and we get find out later in the movie that they're aware of it and then this specific thing happens in the movie that peter does and the movie, that's when we have the kid that was his bully comes back with his cousin and, or his, yeah, cousin and friends or some older kids. His little posse. Yeah. And then it becomes like a haunted house movie. And as creepy as it was at the beginning, the latter half, you never, like you said, you never have any kind of feeling that Peter is really in danger. He feels safe throughout the entire movie even because of the, because of the relationship that he has with the thing in the wall that's talking to him. He feels like he's always safe and these other people come in and they're kind of all the action that really happens besides what happens that Peter does to his parents. All that happens there, that's where they it feels like the budget was really spent on like, we're going to make this kind of gory. We're going to put the effects in this part of the movie. We're really going to ramp it up. And it's just really incongruous. It just doesn't feel like it fits. It feels like it was just kind of stuffed in there because they needed a way to finish this movie. Otherwise, it would have been this whole haunted house thing. The invasion home invasion part of the movie is like the last 25 to 30 minutes of the movie. It feels like they just didn't have enough to do without that piece of it. And it feels really wonky when you put the two pieces together because it just doesn't seem like it's the same movie. It doesn't really match up. Yeah. The other thing that really bothers me with this movie and what i'm about to say we've said before like you have to decide in a movie how much like rope you want to give it are you going to believe this bullshit or are you going to go along with this bullshit you know that type of thing and knowing that this movie or at least i'm sure this movie takes place in modern times knowing like how students are i don't want to say how they're treated but how adults respond to students not like teachers and stuff it's really annoying to me that at no point you have this substitute teacher who's not shown up at this kid's house not once not twice but three times this kid's making what's suspicious isn't the right word concerning artwork in class which everyone like it's all over the news every day now that's some kind of red flag the principal is aware of what's going on he's basically like eh fuck it you know <laughs> whatever fine it's fine like, yeah fine how the fuck at no point in this movie, no fucking point, even after this teacher shows up at the house, is she's not assaulted, but she's intimidated, indirectly threatened. Yeah. Yeah. I think she hears something in the house. And which, by the way, the whole way they hide his noise that he's making is, I'm like, I got a washing machine. My, we have these stupid things that we put in our washing machine that, or in our dryer that supposedly removes wrinkles. I'm like, doesn't the dryer remove wrinkles? Like tennis no, balls you need to put the, these the in wool there. balls or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And they just, they clank around and make all kinds <laughs> of noise. There's no way I would mistake that for a child trying to kick down a fucking door. Like those are two separate noises coming from two separate parts of the house. So you don't, call the cops you don't call cps you don't do any of the things that we all know in 2023 if any of these one things are happening cps is they might not do anything because let's be real it's a they're not always the most well-run agency but they're showing up they're knocking on your door they're not just like not doing they're again they're not being the principal and be like eh, whatever let's go get some coffee I don't know. It, it feels really dumb to me in that aspect. And it's really hard to believe that the only person that gives 
any monogramless shit about this kid is this substitute teacher. I guess we should probably talk more about the parents because we've kind of glossed over how they're weird. Well, I mean, do we really need to get into how weird the parents are? But they're they're weird. <laughs> <laughs> the mom is like schizophrenic well, or paranoid or something. She's very like pr- overprotective. The dad is pretty abusive. And again, we don't, f- it's just in these fits and, s- and starts that the dad really, his character of being this really menacing person comes out. They punish Peter because of his incident that he has at school by locking him in the basement in a door behind the refrigerator that just like, you can't get out of it. They put the refrigerator back. They just like, yeah, you're not getting nothing. Sit here. And that's it. And you're sitting here until we decide that you're coming up. That's when the teacher comes and bang, bang, bang on the door and all this stuff. But even on top of how creepy these characters are, I had, there's a specific sequence of events that happened in this movie where I think it's the first time the teacher comes to the house. They, she talks to the mom, Lizzie Kaplan, talks to her and she goes and talks to Peter and Peter has a clear scrape on his chin. Like, he has a clear, like, bloody scrape on his chin, and I had to... looks like he got popped with, like, a bat or something. Like, something happened, and I had to rewind the movie, because I was like, wait, did I miss something? Like, how did this happen? And then they show the scene, and then after the scene, something happens at school where he scrapes his chin, and that's, like, how it happens, but they don't... It's, like, out of sequence, and someone borderline a, a continuity person or somebody the editor watching this they should have picked this up and been like wait a second this doesn't make sense if i wasn't watching this at home where i could rewind it and watch it again i'd be like okay i would i must have just missed something but it just flat out doesn't happen it's not unforgivable but it's just such a weird sequence of things to happen the way that it happens it's not a big deal it's just it just seems really weird and out of place because the rest of the movie feels very polished like, it feels very well done, at least from a technical standpoint. It's like a polished turd. Well, it feels very well done, except for this, for me, this one very, very, very specific thing that I just couldn't not pay attention to after it happened. So I'm going to disagree with you on one thing that's not polished at all that I think looks fucking terrible in this movie. And this is where we get towards the end. And I know we're jumping around, but I, I, I don't care. So you mentioned when we get to the third act, like, things ratchet up and we start seeing... This is where really anything that is remotely close to like the horror movie side of this, that's not just like creepy bumps in the night happens. This is where people start getting dismembered and whatnot. And essentially we find out that the thing in the wall is, I'm just going to call her a monster because I don't want to totally, I mean, my final thought will, Jerry Springer final thought will ruin that a little bit, but, or a lot of bit, but I don't care. Just fuck this movie. But when they finally get to the point of showing you the monster, not just because this movie spends a lot of time doing the less is more theory where you hear things, you see little bits of things, you see something scurry, you get little tastes of whatever, but you don't get the full reveal until the very, very end of the movie. And when you see the monster's face, it looks like something out of like a bug's life, like the cart, the children's Pixar cartoon. It looks fucking terrible. And you know what it really looks like to me? Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the window liquor video by Aphex Twin, Richard D. James, the the oh God, the smiley yeah. face? That's yeah. what it looked like to me. It looks more cartoony than that. To yeah. Me, but yes, I think the window liquor Richard D. James face looks better, <laughs> looks better than this. Just for the record, even. Yeah. And when you're seeing this before what this character is, it's kind of like. And again, this is a reoccurring theme with this movie. It's kind of like a mix of the chick that crawls out of the well in the ring, whatever her name was, Reagan from The Exorcist, yeah, Spider and Walking. Rapunzel. Yeah, like it's it's a mix of those things. And she also, for some reason, has like Spider-Man powers and like superhuman strength, but can't break out of a shitty hole like wall. But yeah, it's very true. A very a plaster wall. She just can't make it out. She needs to be let out. Right, but she can literally like disembowel humans, like nothing yeah you instantaneous know? that for me was the the final straw on it for me like i was already like at the point of fuck this movie at this point like i'm kind of over it but i was like all right let's let's see what this piece of shit kit like wall child looks like let's see what hugo from the simpsons look like looks like that's deep cut if you don't know that reference we have to call and it the it just went, well <laughs> different episode but yes <laughs> different halloween episode right anyway when that when they finally revealed this thing, I'm just like, I was like, man, I am so fucking done with this piece of shit. I don't know what the budget was. Again, this is a Lionsgate movie, so they had to have enough money to make this. I think I can't believe they didn't have enough money to make this look. I'm not even saying good, but better. 
because you only see this thing's face for about 20 seconds, if that. And yeah, just totally shat the bed on it. So anyway, should we continue to bitch or do we have anything else we really want to go on with it? I, I think we're pretty clear on where we stand on this one. Or do we want to start serving up some hot dogs here? Well, I just want to say that I, I disagree. I think that they do. Ve- of, I think they do a good job of holding the monster like they wait until the very last second to show this thing they do a good job of keeping you in suspense as to like what am i going to see this thing's face what does it look like is how creepy is it but yeah i would agree that the the actual makeup or the effect or whatever it is i'm going to stand really firm on they got some cast off of richard d james masks from the window liquor video to put on this thing's face i can't be swayed i'm sorry that's all right (laughs) I'm going to die on this hill, guy. I'm, I'm all right with that. But I'm ready for, yeah. We, uh, I'm ready to just wrap it up with this. Because to use a phrase from you, it's going to be circling the drain. It's just going to be a big a big bitch fest. And I'd rather just, <laughs> not to tip my hand on what my hot dog is going to be, hot dog rating is going to be. But I think I mentioned to you in the text, I kind of just want to finish so I don't have to think about this movie anymore. And I totally agree with you. Yeah, we almost postponed recording this and we decided not to just to get this over with. So, <laughs> all right. You want me to go first? You know, I'll go first. I think you went first last time. Okay, whatever. So I think Cobweb, it's a weird, just a weird kind of horror movie. It's almost like I mentioned before, there are two movies in one. We start with that strange horror movie trope of the strange family, the strange house, the strange thing living in the wall. And then we move into kind of this creature feature haunted house story by the end of the whole thing. Because that creature feature part comes at the end, we get so little of it. It's very action packed. And I would have liked to have seen maybe the whole ratio of the movie, if not the whole movie, just more focus around this creature feature slash haunted house idea rather than it be like 70% weird family, weird kid, weird shit in the house and 30% creature feature. I'd like to see it either flipped or ultimately not have anything about the family, just to have the family be terrorized by this weird thing, something like that. It's... There's just no intrigue. The, it doesn't do anything to help the movie in the long run to have it split up like this. It's really just incongruous. It, it's just a weird movie, and it's not It's not something I will ever remember after we finish this episode unless someone brings it up, and I'll say, like I said earlier, oh, yeah, is that the movie about the thing in the wall? I got to give it five Aphex Twin Faces out of 11 hot dogs. So this is the most spoiler that we'll get, but I cannot do a Seth Rogen impersonation, but you'll have to imagine this being read in seth rogan's voice i imagine when this movie was pitched seth rogan went so what if we had a mom and a dad that like kill people but you never see them kill people and they have two kids and one of them's like a spider or some shit for some reason but we don't explain that either that's pretty much what this movie is it's just a weird machete cut of ideas that were done better in other movies nothing really pays off well and this is one of the few times that I'll say this, this movie would have done so much, made so much more sense to almost get a rewrite, throttle back, take the idea of this like weird offshoot fairy tale and this kid's story and almost like make it a, if you're going to go haunted house story, make it a true PG-13 haunted house story, make it something that kids can go watch, drop it in October and make a shit ton of money. That means you're going to take out some of the, like, a lot of the third act, or at least write it in a way that's more palatable for a younger audience, but it would have made it a better story than this attempt at trying to browbeat us into thinking this is some groundbreaking horror. It's not. There's really no huge redeeming quality in it to me. There's some good actors and actresses in here. If that's, if you like any of them, check it out for that, I guess, but... I would rather watch Black Double Dell from hell <laughs> again and then follow that with an extra viewing of Paranormal Highway than watch this piece of shit again. I'm going to give it two tick blood filled exploding hot dogs out of 10 hot dogs. It, it sucks. <laughs> Fuck this movie. This so. movie makes extra look like a lucid dream. A fucking masterpiece. Yeah. It, 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 does it looks have like some, some goddamn masterpiece. It has some of those elements of like extra a little bit. You know, we have the kid not annoying in this movie, but it just has like these all these kind of off the wall, wacky ideas that are really in the movie that just don't seem to fit together. Maybe some drugs during the writing or filming of the movie would have helped, but uh, I don't know. Certainly would have helped in the watching of the movie. I like your idea but... a lot better, though, to make it more of a PG-13 kids kind of kid oriented movie. And, you don't and see that yeah, a lot you anymore. Don't. Like, like it, it seems like if you did, like, again, your cast is primarily kids. You take the, you make the, like, mom and dad, like, Beetlejuice quirky as opposed to, like, 
whatever the fuck they are in this. Overbearing. And Lizzie and... Kaplan could pull that off for sure. Yeah. So you make them just quirky and weird. I don't know what you do with the teacher. And then you just kind of, I don't want to go as far to say Looney Tune it up, but you almost like monster squat it up in the third act and just make it fun. You'd actually have a movie you could sell. Well, I guess you can sell this, but you'd have one that's watchable at least. Yeah. In theory. That might be good. Right. And again, I don't often advocate for PG-13 R-rated movie, but here we are. All right. Question of the week. So we didn't really have a good one that related to this movie, so we're just going to go generic this week. The question of the week was pretty simple. What horror movie are you most looking forward to seeing in 2023 that has not yet been released? We are recording this on Monday, August 28th, so my answer comes out in a couple days, but we'll get to that. So that just as a barometer for any of these, when you hear this, some of these answers might be out by the time this episode actually drops. Our friends over at Dissect That Film, I, I really like the inflection of how they said this. Five Nights at Freddy's, I guess. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the I guess being added on there. It makes it very, um, you know, excited. The long <laughs> sigh. Right. <laughs> they're a great group of guys. So definitely check out their podcast. Again, they're at Dissect That Film on Twitter and everywhere. Easy to find. Our good friend Jordana, who will be coming up on our Halloween episode this year, and you can also check her out at Pretty Killer Podcast and Feature Creatures DTF. She mentioned that she is excited for Eli Roth's Thanksgiving and also Five Nights at Freddy's, and she did the touchdown thing. I I don't think that's a football movie, but I'm going for it. Over on Threads, we are on Threads, and Retro Horror Girl on Threads said that she is looking forward to Saw X. Or Saw 10. Do you have any opinion on that one? I'm not the biggest Saw movie fan. I haven't watched any of them since two. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the last one I may have watched was two or three. So I don't, but I'm not saying that it's mm. not going to be good. I just don't Sure. I don't really have much of an opinion on Saw. It kind of went a little too right. far for me. It just, I don't know. It, and again, I'm not saying this as a negative because I'm a Friday the 13th fan, which does this in every movie, but it felt very recycled to me by the second movie. And that's kind of why I lost interest in it. Again, I'll watch any Michael Myers, Jason, whatever you throw in my lap. And that's been recycled for fucking four decades now. But I guess to each your own, right? I think for me, for Saw, it seemed at the time like seven, kind of the seven scenes, you know, seven where it was the seven deadly sins. And it seemed like yeah. it pulled a lot out of that seven magic hat, but did a lot more like edge lordy. And I was, eh, I wasn't yeah. really down for it. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Then over on Instagram at Horror Flicks and Guitar Picks Pod, which you can also follow them on Instagram and check out their podcast as well. They also said the movie Thanksgiving. So for those who aren't aware, Thanksgiving was one of the trailers that was in the Grindhouse movie, which we talked about recently when we did our Machete episode. It has some really, I don't even know if you can still pull the trailer because it's got some really sexual content in the trailer. But if you can, it's worth watching. And we see original trailer. Not sure what the new one looks like yet. Do you have a question of the or a answer for the question of the week, John? So, I mean, I don't watch a lot of modern horror except for this show. I like older stuff. We've talked about that a lot. So I you sent a list of all the stuff that was coming out and I looked at it and I was like, you know what? Five Night at Freddy's does look like it could be kind of interesting. We've already had Nick Cage do Willy's Wonderland, which is kind of like it's not a spiritual successor, but it's spiritually kind of along the lines of five night at freddy's in a way but i'd like i'd like to see what they do with it i'm not a big fan of the games or anything but it's one of those things where it's intriguing to me so i guess five night at freddy's would be my answer saw x i'm kind of interested but again like i haven't watched them for a long time but why not well if anyone wants us to watch saw x or is would like us to talk about it let us know all over we'll tell you you know social media etc we if you want us to talk about it we will for me, to answer the question of the week, the movie that I'm kind of most looking forward to at this point, horror movie-wise, would that's new, would be Slaughterhouse. You familiar with this? I know I've sent it to you before. No. <laughs> please, please tell me about it, John. Slaughterhouse is about a sloth that goes into a sorority house, and it turns into a slasher movie. The tagline is, don't rush die slow. So I'm, I'm all for that. That comes out this week, so I'm looking forward to seeing a slasher movie where a sloth is the killer. I think I kind of need to see how that happens. You know what? You probably are, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I also would add that I'm really looking forward to Final Summer, which is just got announced today that it's going to be streaming as of September 18th. 
that really doesn't count as a 2023 release because it technically came out last year, but I've not been able to watch it, so I'm counting it. And I, I'm looking forward to Thanksgiving as well. I'm not a big Eli Roth fan. Generally, I feel like he's just kind of torture porn for the sake of torture porn most, most times, and this movie very well could turn into that. But I laughed my ass off at the Thanksgiving trailer when I saw it in Grindhouse, so that sold a ticket to me for sure. You got anything you want to add to tech on at the end of this hour-long bitch fest? I was going to say, if you're interested in getting your answer read for the question of the week, hit us up at Dewey Pod Monster on all the social media. John will read your answer, because we're always looking for people to give us feedback on what they want to do for whatever the question of the week is. That's absolutely right. And you can also let us know about what other titles you would like us to talk about, what movies you might want to hear us hate on, what movies you might want to hear us love. Any ideas if you want us to talk about a show, music, whatever, we're up for it. And you can also follow Sean at Draft Therapy on YouTube if you're interested in Michigan beer. And check out all that good stuff on Instagram, social networks as well, at Draft Therapy. Kind of switched it up here. Yeah, I'm confused. I'm corn-fused. Corn-fused is, hey, it's time of year. So I think that's all we got for this week. Hopefully next week we'll be a little more chipper. I don't even know what we're talking about next because we're not very good at planning. But we'll be back and we will talk about some movie that might or might not have a wrestler in it. I don't know. We'll see. So, corn fused. Arriva Dare Chi. That's it. Butt face. Penis cheese. Yeah. Oh, that sounds horrible. You hit a new level of horrible. Sayonara, butt face. <laughs>